Welcome to the Diversity Scholarship Foundation's Profiles in the Law. I am your host, Justice Jesse G. Reyes, and president of the Diversity Scholarship Foundation. And as we always promise, we present uh, prominent members of the legal profession uh, to present themselves. And today we have one of the stars of the Circuit Court of Cook County, the Honorable E. Kenneth Wright, Jr., who is the presiding judge of the First Municipal Division. Welcome, Judge. Thank you. If you could, uh, uh, before we start uh, talking about the, the court system, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your background in terms of, you know, where you grew up and, you know, why did you want to become a lawyer? I grew up in Arkansas, southern part of Arkansas, right near the Mississippi, the Mississippi line. Um, I um, went to high school in Arkansas. I dropped out of high school, went to work, worked um, in the fields all day long as a small child. And very often I look at children who were about the age when I started working in the fields. And I can't believe I was working at the age in which I see some of the kids who are now uh, uh, the age I was when I was working four days at work. So, so you mentioned that you dropped out of high school. I did. Yes, and so uh, what motivated you to go back and then to go on to, uh, you know, higher education and ultimately get your When license? I dropped out of high school, I was fortunate to have a teacher who saw that I could do the work and I would do well and who came to the fields to get me. I dodged. I was dirty and working in the fields. And she came, found, because there were no such thing as addresses. She had to kind of find us through asking neighbors. Um, she came out and asked my parents if I could come to school. And I uh, went back to school, and the rest is history. Well, that's very fortunate uh, you know, for you. And it's a good uh, story also for to our younger viewers to, to realize that uh, all is not lost, right? And even after maybe you drop out of high school or you don't go to college right away, I think there's always an opportunity if, if you desire to, uh, to, to go that path. Yes. I was also fortunate enough when I completed high school, uh, I had a great time in high school, and I was fortunate enough to meet a great man, Frank Smith, who was, became our principal only one year. And I was going to go to the military because I didn't see an option to go to college and I didn't know anybody who had gone to college except my teachers and I didn't really know, know them uh, except from school. He called me the last of July, just before school was going to start in September to ask me if I wanted to go to college. Great. And I went to visit with him and we completed the application in his office that night and I got accepted to college. Now, uh, going to college and then the, to law school as well, uh, um, I know that you had to work a variety of different jobs to, to, uh, in order to you know, pay your way um, through your uh, high school and college and, and law school careers. Um, could you explain some of the, or provide us with some information regarding um, some of the jobs that you had? When, when I was in college, the first job I had was working at a Dairy Queen. It was fun because I always enjoyed going to Dairy Queen and taking my girlfriend to Dairy Queen from time to time, and I could have things that I couldn't afford to buy. So I enjoyed that, that service. I enjoyed working there. And I went from there and I worked on the farm, the college farm for a while, also there. Then I worked in the president's office. And in the summer months, I worked on the farm again. And so that's how I made, and I came to Chicago before I graduated from college. Came to Chicago, worked as a parking attendant mm -hmm. in Chicago, at Randolph from Franklin, uh, across the street from, uh, I can't remember that nice new building they have there now. I worked, I worked there for a number of years. Wow, so Tips you- Tips were only a quarter then. So you are definitely an inspiration to uh, everyone, and particularly our young people, you know, an example of you continue you know, persisting and working hard, um, overcoming obstacles, and now to become the uh, presiding judge of the uh, first district 
uh, in the Circuit Court of Cook County, which actually is the largest uh, unified system of courts uh, in the country. That's correct. That's correct. It is. I was fortunate one morning I was assigned to the probate division, and uh, Judge Evans called me after my call started and said that he wanted to see me after the call started. Going to I the had principal's no idea. office, right? Yes. <laughs> I said, what did I do? Um, and he didn't ask me. He just told me that I was going to be the presiding judge of the first district. And so that was a great feeling. I was kind of frightened about it. He said to come up after I finished my call that afternoon, and he would tell me more about it. So I've been there ever since. So could you uh, explain to our viewers a little bit about the uh, structure of the court system in, in Cook County? Because you mentioned you know, you're the presiding judge of first district. How many districts are there? There's uh, six districts, and we have the first one. Our district is located downtown. In fact, it's surrounded by bordered Washington, Clark, Dearborn, Randolph. It's surrounded by that. And it has, we have, um, Everything that we have, other areas, we have um, eviction is one of our main courts. We have a lot of people there who come there often. We have consumer debt. And in both those courts, let me stop and reiterate, in both those courts, we have what's called ERP operation. That's early resolution. Those courts that people are able to, if they qualify, to get assistance, money, and help in doing their cases if they're far behind and if it was due to the pandemic because we had a pandemic that lasted several years. Matter of fact, it started in March 20, 2020, and we didn't start back until um, July, August of 21. And it's been going on in ways that we are glad it's going on because we've developed what's called a um, hybrid system now where we have um, Zoom calls, anything other than trials where you have to solicit information. We have those calls that, that people do not have to actually come into the building to have a Zoom call. And it saves time for the lawyers mm -hmm. as well as other litigants. And if uh, anybody wanted to get information about their court calls and like when their case might be up, now how would they be able to avail themselves of that information? There's a number of the clerk's office the clerk is the one who sets the case call dates, the initial call. After initial call dates and times, we set them ourselves. We, the judges, set those calls ourselves. And they, there's a number in clerk's office. Uh, I don't know the specific number that they would call. It's probably six, area code 312-603-6000. Would probably be the number that they would call there, but I don't know the specific number to the clerk's office. And um, at the uh, courts that you mentioned uh, that fall under your jurisdiction or your purview of uh, supervision, those are all located within the Daly Center? Yes. We also have criminal cases that are in the districts. They're in the city of Chicago only. We have one of our misdemeanor and felony preliminary hearing calls courts at 727 East 111th Street. That's on four south side of Chicago. Then we have another one we call Harrison and Kedzie. That's also misdemeanor and felony preliminary hearings. Uh, that's uh, 3140 West Florinoi. And then we have two misdemeanor courts at 5555 West Grand Avenue in Chicago. And there are two misdemeanor calls, two branch, branches 23 and 29 there. The reason I'm smiling is because uh, when I was a trial court judge, I remember sitting in some of those assignments back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> yeah, you were there. <laughs> um, so um, the other thing I wanted to uh, also bring up is that as a presiding judge of the first district, one of the other responsibilities also is on time uh, to serve on the Chief Judge's uh, Executive Committee. Yes, yeah. that's 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 uh, important, and we see it as important because we sit on the Chief Judge's Executive Committee. We make decisions about the court, 
uh, the chief judge brings us in, all the presiding judges, and from time to time we decide as to what, based on a problem that we have to resolve, what is best for the court system. And we also determine associate judge. Is, uh, we don't determine their qualification by and large. We, we use the bar associations along with our own interviews to determine the fitness of lawyers to sit as judges, as associate process to be appointed. And as you mentioned, associate judges, uh, just so our viewers understand, these are individuals that want to be members of the Circuit Court of Cook County as a judge, and they uh, submit their credentials to the Bar Associations, yes. Chicago Bar Association, and then the Alliance of uh, uh, Bar Associations, and then they're evaluated and vetted uh, by these uh, organizations, uh, and then eventually then um, their credentials and their uh, uh, information is provided to the executive committee. Yes. And then you interview them as well? We interview them as well. Yes. And anybody who believes they're qualified, even though they may not believe, the bar associate may not believe that they qualify, they allow to interview with the process. They're involved with going, we don't reject anybody on the basis of what necessarily what the Bar Association do. We find them very helpful in helping us mm -hmm. weed out and letting people know also what their shortcomings may or may not be and what they need to do in order to prepare themselves for the associate process. Sure. And then also for our viewers so they understand, these bar associations, they have people who are serving as investigators who actually go out and, you know, ask people questions and uh, conduct interviews about the candidates' qualifications and credentials. Yes. And it's not just the people you write down on your list as people they can contact. It also people in your community. It may be your pastor or the person who work on your automobile or your friends or your people who are not necessarily your friends. They want to know about you, the person. And they do their due diligence to determine what as to what they have been told is correct. And so they don't just take a person's word who say you're a bad guy or you're a good guy. They try to determine whether or not more people are saying yes, 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 or no, 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 along with a no, no, and then a yes, to see if that no means anything. And it, it's, it's a good test, and I think it's something we all need. I'm always nervous when I have to go through it, and I've been through it many times. But it still is something that I'm glad that somebody's holding our feet to the fire because we're, it's our money, our taxpayer money that funds us, that we promise that we will be fair and that we know the law, we know the procedures in which must be followed, and that we're polite and courteous to all. And knowing that, it, 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 it helps us stay on the track, on track. Right, because after all, ultimately, the, the courts belong to the people. So That's they right. should have a voice in that process. That's, that's right. uh, and you mentioned the community, and I know, even though you're very busy in your position as presiding uh, judge of the first district, uh, you also are someone who always continually gives back to the community, uh, and you've done that uh, uh, through the bar associations as well. Uh, particularly serving as president of the Chicago Bar Association. So can you talk a little bit about why it's important to give back and then also your role in the Chicago Bar Association? Thank you. I I'm, don't want to be derelict in not saying that I'm a member of the Diversity Scholarship Committee as well. Yes, you are. And that you are chair. Very active. Uh, director yeah. of that. Um, I, I believe it's necessary because these are people we serve and that we ought to give something other than what we get paid for. And going to the community, teaching our kids, being able to help them reach a point where they can survive and take care of themselves and that they can understand what is happening in this world. We are in a very difficult times in our lives, more difficult than probably that I have seen in my life, but somebody has to be able to be, com be comfortable enough to navigate the system. We're hoping that they can navigate it, knowing that you have to give something to receive something. 
And very often, many of us just kind of want to receive rather than giving, giving back to people who are less fortunate, giving to people who are fortunate. Because as my pastor would say very often, is that you have to bless up in order to get down. Somebody has to give some of the people up right. in order to have something to come down. And so I believe that through the Bar Association, which gives to kids who are kindergarten, Kindergarten Scholars is another organization that I form that gives money to kids to have them tutored as well as give them school supplies and help them in ways that they need to be helped. Any event that a parent needs to get their kid to a particular place, we can even buy gas for their car, assuming they have a car, or make it bus pass for them to learn. We also allow young lawyers to come before our, com and high school people, to come and extern in our offices during the summer months so they can learn what we do and make a decision whether or not they want to work to the point to become a lawyer. I always tell them that a lawyer is one who teaches you to, studying law is one that teaches us to outthink the other man. You may not be able to think outthink the other person, but it teaches you how to. And that's not to go to school to outthink somebody necessarily, but it's how to protect your rights, how to know what they are and how to protect your rights. And I think that something that everybody need to have at least a general knowledge of how to protect yourself. Right, and it's an uh, invaluable service to these young people because they get to understand the court process, to understand how, you know what what happens in the courtrooms and, and the importance of, of the staff and how everybody works intricately together to make sure that justice is done on a daily basis. Justice, may I mention, every first Wednesday of the month, every first Wednesday of the month, and I think the next Wednesday is October 2nd maybe, mm -hmm. We have a joint meeting of judges, lawyers, and the community to come to my courtroom, 1307 at 8 a.m. in the morning. We serve coffee and rolls uh, there, so you don't have to pick up your roll or coffee on the way to work. And we, are, we promptly start at 8 o'clock. We discuss whatever happens in our court, how procedures, new laws that happen in our court. We have a speaker always who talks about something in the law, and it's open to anybody who wants to come in the morning, 8 o'clock a.m., and it ends promptly at 9 o'clock. So you're able to get to your court calls, mm -hmm. to your job, or whatever you have to do. Um, that well, that's, that's great. And, uh, and you br personally bring the rolls? Yes. Okay. I do. All right. And coffee. <laughs> and uh, wh where is your courtroom located at? Located in Richard J. Daly Center. You have to come in on the Washington side of Richard J. Daly Center, and my courtroom number is 1307, and you, the meeting starts promptly at 8 a.m., and you can get in to any time between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, so you will not be late. Okay. And, uh, and unfortunately, because of the times that we live in, um, they also have to make sure that they get through the security yes. in, the, in, the, uh, in the building. You can't. You cannot bring any kind of contraband, no weapons of any kind, no nothing that can be used as a weapon. You cannot bring it into the office. Your phone may be checked when you come in. You may have to take your belt off when you come in. I don't know quite the procedure, but I know you have to go through security before you can come into the building. Right. But we'll welcome you. If we know in advance, we'll put your name on the list so you will not have to wait until 8 o'clock to get in. Right. And again, it's only because of the times that we live in. We have to make sure that not only the individuals who are coming into the building are, are secure and safe, but everybody else that's in the building already. That's correct. Yeah. Justice, may I mention that we have a retention class coming up, retention of judges, where judges are retained every two years as a group of judges that come up to be retained. And we go before the Bar Association to find if we're fit to be retained as judges. It's a very important process that we go through, but it's necessary to do that. It's necessary to have the public know who we are and vote to retain us. We are qualified judges, and we want to be retained by you. So I want to put a plug in for the all the retention judges who are up November 5th. 
I don't have our numbers yet, but they'll be out soon. Okay. And again, we should remind our viewers that it's important, number one, to make sure you go out and vote um, and make sure you exercise your right uh, to vote. But in particular, because unfortunately the judges are at the end of the ballot, you have to make sure that you go all the way to the end of the ballot and, and vote for the judges. I think it's important to vote for the judges because they're individuals that uh, many of us will see and go in front of or be affected by their decisions. Yes. More so than the president or the senator or governor or anybody else. Uh, or the appellate court or the, or the Supreme Congress. Court. Right. <laughs> <laughs> may not see those, yeah. but you'll see me. Yeah, but you'll see the trial judges. <laughs> so it's important to go out and vote for these individuals uh, and make sure you educate yourself about them. You, you mentioned the bar associations. They will have a lot of information uh, with regards to um, uh, these individuals that are running for uh, retention. And, and how many judges are there? 82, I believe. 82. So there's quite a few names, but again, I think, you know, it only takes a, a matter of minutes. It's important that uh, uh, you go out and vote. And, you know, it's, it's a lot easier now because now oh, we yes. got the early voting uh, and it goes almost all the way to, a, to election day. You can mail in your ballots. So there really is no excuse not to exercise your right to vote. And I think it's a very important uh, right uh, that many people in other countries do not have. Oh, uh, yes. And uh, so it's important to, to make sure that we, we go out there and vote. And thank you for, you know, for uh, bringing, uh, bringing that up. Um, also, with regards to... Um, you mentioned your, your program with the kindergarten students. Um, how, if anybody wanted to get involved with that, how would they get involved with that to help you in, in that effort? They, they could call area code 312, and I'm sorry, 847, 847-997-6459. And, and uh, we also want to mention that you're going to be on that retention ballot also, right? Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> Please, vote for me. I don't know what my number will be, but uh, and we don't that's have because, ballot uh, They're still doing the process of evaluating people, and so it hasn't uh, been determined yet, you know, who's going to be on the ballot. And But we should know shortly, right, I would believe? Yes, we will. Yeah. And all the judges are qualified, and so we need to support them all, all of us need to be retained. Um, we're human beings. We have failures sometimes and things we do. We have to try to understand the people who come before us and know that we have a job and we try to, the best we can to do that job as effectively and proficiently as we can and efficiently as we can do it. And so please help us out a bit. If we do something that you don't quite understand, please ask us. Stop us, ask us. If we're on Zoom, ask if you can wait to the end of the call or whatever it happens to be to ask us questions. We're human. And then one other thing that I wanted to make sure that our viewers were aware of is you're working on a program right now currently for uh, pro se litigants. Yes. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I've developed a video that tells pro se litigants how to deal with consumer debt problems, that's debts having to do with credit cards, automobiles, bills that you haven't paid, small debts that, that do not have any kind of liens. Um, we also deal with evictions. And a number of times we have evictions and we have to make sure that there's a process and that litigants who don't have lawyers will have difficult time navigating the system. So we want very much to help you in doing so we have a video to tell you first that you need a lawyer. These are, these are not easy cases to try or to defend. You need help. And if you can't get one, the video will show you kind of steps you can take. Artificial intelligence is going to be a thing that's going to come into our system. It's coming in whether we know it or not. We, it works through the telephone that we use. It works through the Zoom methods we use. It's a thing that helps litigants navigate the system. The only thing about it right now, it's kind of expensive to use. We're hoping some kind of way it get funded in a way through the county or through the city or through the state in a way that is provided in a way that can help all pro se litigants. 
navigate that system. And so I'm hoping that I'll get this up and running sometime this year. I'm going to roll it out September 16th just for trial so judges and lawyers can see it and tell me what I need to critique in order to get it on the YouTube. So you can watch it from home or wherever you happen to be. Well, we'll look forward to that. Uh, you know, again, I just want to, uh, on behalf of uh, the Diversity Scholarship Foundation, want to thank you for your service, uh, not only to the bench, uh, but to the bar and to the community at large. You are truly uh, a public servant and an inspiration for, for many of us. And I want to thank you for being on this program. Um, and then we want to thank you for watching the Diversity Scholarship Foundation's Profiles in the Law. And uh, we will be coming uh, shortly again with another prominent member of the legal profession um, to discuss issues and uh, other uh, matters uh, that we are faced with uh, today. So uh, this has been a pleasure having Judge Wright here with us. And I have been your host, uh, Justice Jesse Reyes, President of the Diversity Scholarship Foundation. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you.